This is TGP Nominal. Welcome to Yuri's Night. This is our 20th anniversary Yuri's Night. We're super excited. We kicked off this party in 2001. And at the time, we said it was a party we wanted to be celebrated in 10,000 years in the future, a holiday that's still relevant to humanity, even when we're scattered among 12 different star systems. And we're excited to still be going strong after 20 years. Our This event celebrates the uh, anniversary of Yuri Gagarin, the first human to go into space, April 12th, 1961. So it's the 60th anniversary year this year. It's a big year. And also, 20 years later to the day, the United States took had the first space shuttle flight takeoff, April 12th, 1981. And so it's a conjunction of two extraordinary space anniversaries. And we like to use um, Yuri's night to celebrate the power of space to bring the world together. So that's what we're about. That's why we encourage people around the world to celebrate this day and encourage and to help our, unify our little planet here. And so we're super excited to have the UK involved this year and hosting events and being doing your part. Um, I know there's also a party going on today in Moscow. So we're super excited to welcome them as well as a bunch of parties in Japan, um, and the, and the Antarctica, as well as Africa and throughout the world. So this really is a global celebration. We're excited that the UN has declared this International uh, Human Space Flight Day, uh, and there's already been Cosmonautics Day in Russia for forever. So it's really a fabulous day. There's an extraordinary event going on in Helsinki on, on Monday as well. And I just get moved just thinking about what we're capable of as a species when we put aside our egos and do what's best for the future of of our cosmos. So thank you for being part of it. Um, my name is Loretta Whitesides. I'm a future astronaut at Virgin Galactic. I'm the founder of Yuri's Night. Um, and I am really passionate and dedicated to getting everyone in the space community together and feeling a part of this, a part of uh, something, something bigger than themselves and feeling heard and known and appreciated. And um, I'm glad you're here. And I challenge you to take on being the person you've always wanted to be because there's something that you came to earth to do and hopefully it has something to do with space. Maybe it doesn't. And I challenge you to do it because if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. And we all need to step up and start being crew of Spaceship Earth. So thanks for being part of this journey. Thanks for being part of this community and let's rock the planet. Poyahuli. Oh, Merck. <laughs> good start. Absolutely good start. Had to be done. Had to be done. So everybody, welcome to uh, Yuri's Night UK. Uh, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight into the cosmos. Um, we're doing a kind of a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, get in touch and we will do our best to answer the questions for you. Um, I have a, a panel of guests uh, with me. Um, first of all, I have Kate Arkless Gray, um, otherwise known as Space Kate. I have Dr. Ryan Kobrick, and I also have uh, Janelle Harrier Wilson. Um, and I'll go through everybody. If um, Kate, if you could go first, if you could tell people a little bit about yourself. Oh, I'm a strange old fish, really. Um, I Space wasn't a thing when I was younger. Like, it just wasn't really a thing in the UK that we were taught very much about. But I always liked the idea of um, new boundaries and exciting new stuff. So I, I set myself the challenge to be a cutting edge scientist and follow genetics because that seemed to be like the cool thing. Um, and it was going to be the future. And frankly, it sort of is. But um, yeah, it wasn't until I was about 29 that I met somebody from NASA and was so thrilled at this idea that it was a real person from a real space agency and it made space real for me. And I was like, wow. Uh, and I haven't looked back since. I'm a massive space nerd. I did my best to 
uh, share my passion, share the adventure, tell the stories and get people excited about space because yeah, it, it is pretty damn exciting. <laughs> Ryan, what about yourself? Yeah, um, well, I'm a chronic space geek too. Um, I think it's almost impossible to trace back to like what the early inspirations were. I mean, I always look, love looking up at the stars, which is, you know, a great fit that we're connecting here with uh, UK astronomy. Um, and so I'm an engineer, so bear with me. Uh, I might go all over the place when I talk, but I'll get to a point eventually. And I've always been fascinated by the way things work. And so I think just understanding how not just mechanical things work and how they fit together and, and how they function, but even people are placed here in, in the universe and um, how that's important for exploration in our future. Um, so I gravitated towards being involved with Yuri's Night almost instantly as soon as I, I met Loretta in like 2003. Um, I was doing an internship at the XPRIZE Foundation and she's like, want to help with the space party? And I'm like, I'm in. Let's do it. Um, so I was heavily involved for a long time. I was the, the chair and president for almost a decade. Um, and now I'm kind of like sitting back, relaxing a bit and just trying to help out here and there um, by participating in events. So right now, my real world job is uh, as an engineer and I'm helping design the life support for the next lunar lander, the human landing system, uh, working at Paragon Space Development Corporation. And I'm living back in Colorado, so we're happy to be back here. Um, strange things have happened this year and moving across the country from Florida to Colorado with two kids and dog and everything is pretty intense. Um, but that's what exploration is. Uh, you need to be able to, you know, take those steps that you both believe in and also that you find satisfaction in uh, what you're working on. So. And Janelle. Hi, so um, I am a, a science teacher and I grew up in Florida, been hugely into space pretty much as long as I can remember. I think the first time I went to Kennedy Space Center, I was like 18 months old. So that the space bug hit super early. Um, yeah. And um, I've See, had I need a teacher like you. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Um, so I, I've had opportunity to do lots of cool things as, as an educator to help inspire students in, in space and space education. So I've done like Space Academy for Educators a couple twice, which is amazing. I did, I've done a microgravity flight with NASA, which was beyond incredible. And, and so I'm just, trying to reach next generation, inspire them to, to take up the mantle and, and get to the places we haven't managed to get in my generation, which is when I was a kid, I thought, you know, by now we'd have been back to the moon and it hasn't happened, which is kind of sad. So it looks like we're getting closer and I'm really excited about that. And hopefully students that I teach will be some of those that will be designing the rockets and, and being on the spacecraft and, and maybe getting us on, on to Mars as well. Awesome. So Yuri's Night is all about that. It's all about bringing the world together. As Loretta said, it's, it's all about having one goal. And that is that I, I like the way that Loretta put it in, in a conversation I had with her was that when we're living off world, that we can have one day where we can all get together and celebrate one thing. Um, and that's what Yuri's Night is all about. Um, as she said, Cosmonautics Day in Russia and with the United Nations, it's now called the International Day of Human Space Flight. But Yuri's Night sounds so much better. <laughs> so <laughs> um, what I would like to ask you all firstly is what was the moment that said to you that space and space flight was your thing because i mean I, I can remember watching stuff on tv obviously um but i can remember once again watching it on television with my grandfather i actually watched sts1 the columbia launch and that was a moment that i had with my grandfather and then a couple of years later he, he said we're, we're going on a field trip and i was like where, where are we going and uh, we went to Stansted Airport and I thought, what, what are we doing here? And all of a sudden, this big plane landed with the Enterprise 
on its back. So, uh, uh, for anyone out there, I'm, I'm not talking about the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> um, uh, the the prototype for the space shuttle was called the Enterprise, and that was the first time that I saw something up close. Uh, that changed everything for me. So, yeah. So, uh, who wants to go first? Well, picking up on that, you seeing something and that made it real for you. Um, you know, I, I sort of joke that a, a pin badge changed my life, but it's actually true. Um, I was given the NASA, a NASA pin badge, the little uh, meatball logo. I didn't know at the time that you could pick them up in the gift stores. I had never been to any of the gift stores. I was in Canada at a theoretical physics conference and I'd been producing these outreach sessions called Science in the Pub. And like any good producer, I'd had a couple of drinks and at the end uh, of the session, are we all going to live on Mars? Um, I was super excited, it'd gone really well. Uh, and I went to talk to Dr. Chris McKay, the astrobiologist. Oh my goodness, like if somebody had told me that astrobiology was a subject that I could have studied, then wow, sorry genetics, but that would have been really cool. <laughs> um, and yeah, I was talking to him and, and for me, that was literally the first time that space became real. You know, I, I think, you know, all my life I'd been in, interested in it. I love looking up at the stars, even though, you know, as a Londoner, I don't really get to see that many of them. So, yeah, when I've travelled around the world and, and had dark skies and seen the Milky Way, you know, that's blown my mind completely. But I'd never really kind of appreciated that it was something that I could be part of or I could be involved in. So that's why I think, you know, the work that Janelle does with the students is so incredibly important. And, you know, making it real for people so anytime I go to an event now, I'll, I'll pick up an extra sticker or a badge and I look out just generally, if I see somebody who looks like they were, they might be excited about space, big kid, little kid, I don't mind, I will, will hand them over the thing. Because when actually I was given this pin badge, this is a slightly embarrassing story, but I was so excited, I got very high pitched, squeaked about it, because um, he'd said, I've got something for you, reach into his pocket, give me the pin badge. I thought that this was his official staff pin. I thought I was very special and I had been given an official staff pin from NASA and was very squeakily excited about it. And Chris, bless him, um, <laughs> calmly sort of said, oh, um, well, I, I always carry a few of those in my pocket. I, I kind of paused for a moment thinking, oh, I'm not special. And then he said, just in case I meet any small children. And I was like, oh my gosh, I embarrassed myself in front of like the first person I've ever met who works in actual NASA. Um, I made an impression, we stayed in touch, and that's where my adventure began. So making space real, I think, is really important. Actually, you say in that, uh, the uh, private astronaut, Richard Garriott, he always carries a few mission patches with him wherever he goes, just in case. It's a great thing to do. Yeah, super thing to do. I was once given, sorry, uh, tell me to shut up. I get excited about space and then I rab it on. But no. I, I once had the honor of meeting one of the Japanese astronauts and he gave me a set of his mission patches. And again, I was like, wow, these are just amazing. And he said, oh, well, you know, I mean, they make good drinks coasters. <laughs> yeah. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm going to frame these things. He's like, oh, well, you could do that if you want, but, but they are pretty good drinks coasters. What about you, Janelle? I mean, you, you grew up in Florida, so... I did, and we would sometimes be able to see um, space launches from, from our house. We lived on the opposite coast, on the Gulf Coast, but pretty much just on the opposite side of Florida. Um, and I never actually had a chance to see a launch in person, um, like, at Kennedy Space Center until um, STS-132, which was uh, supposed to be the final flight of Atlantis, but became its first final flight, if anybody knows that story, because mm. they ended up doing a, a second flight for the actual final, final flight of the program. So uh, like I said, I first visited Kennedy Space Center when I was like too young to remember, but obviously old enough for it to make an impression on me because I was like hugely into space ever since and, and just really, really loved everything to do with space, stars. Um, I would, when I was a kid, I would, I had magazines I subscribed to that were space magazines. Um, one of them was for kids and one of them was astronomy magazine, which is one for adults. I would check out all of the astronomy books in the library so much that they started buying new astronomy books in, in the library. So that was kind of cool. Um, 
And then, I, you know, I didn't think a whole bunch uh, much about it. I went to university and I got a degree in psychology. And then I was like, what, wh why? I don't know. And then I got into teaching and science teaching, which I absolutely love. And, and then I got back into really space and space education. And um, so part of it started on Twitter. And I know I've, everyone here is on Twitter. And um, I met people when I first joined Twitter. And I think I joined in 2009. So it's been a while. Um, who are really into into space and people who worked at NASA and I made some really good friends um, and I there's this group that and I know some of you know about it too the Space Treat Society and, and got to know people and, and started meeting up with people and that was just really cool um, and then I got like I said I got to go to space camp and do all these other things so I think that was kind of what really got me first interested in it just as a child but then into it as, as this outreach side and education side um, as well as I, once I started teaching and then getting back into space and, and now that I know people and know astronomers and engineers and stuff, it's really cool because I'm able to connect my students with people who actually work in the industry, which is amazing. And that's one of my favorite things to do. And Ryan, growing up in Canada, I mean, that must have been a bit, bit different for getting involved with or embracing space. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, these stories are awesome. And I just try to think of like, okay, what was my journey again? And uh, it's really like all the small things adding up. Um, there, when I was like in grade seven, Julie Payette came to visit our school and I got to be like the ambassador student who got to greet her and, you know, walk around with her. And so like, that's, you know, it's a small thing, but it's, a, it's enough to be extremely memorable. Um, before that, also, you know, all roads go through Florida eventually, right? We're all going to launch, not all, but there's lots of other places to launch. But, um, you know, all the humans in North America, la mostly launching from there, especially growing up, um, was that I know I still have tickets from KSC from when I was six uh, when we visited because my grandparents lived in Florida. So we would go down almost every winter um, and then we would go to Disney for a few days and sometimes we'd go all the way to KSC because um, they were also in on the other coast in Clearwater. And um, just like little things like that. And I think I there's a photo somewhere of me and my brother like in front of the crawler, like the shuttle crawler. Um, and... So it's just those little pieces kind of fitting together. They're, they've always been there. It's kind of like, you know, you go back and watch like a, uh, a movie and you're like, oh, look, all those pieces were there all along. It was just a, no one, maybe they didn't see them until later. Um, so, you know, I was already a big fan of space and in undergrad, um, Chris Hadfield came to visit us at Queens uh, University, um, got to chat with him and got to meet Julie Payette again. Um, and then really it was grad school that really accelerated my actual involvement. Um, there was no clubs or anything at that time. And I highly recommend for anyone who's just say an undergrad, if there isn't a space club or some sort of activity, definitely just create one. Uh, there's a lot of options. There's like SEDS, there's uh, astronomy groups, there's, there, there's, they're countless. Just reach out to any SGAC of us. SGAC we'll as well. Yep. SGAC is uh, Space Gen. Um, Space Gen's involved with a lot of different events, like the International Astronautical Congress, where a lot of us always cross orbits, which is the best place to do that. Um, and so my, my step into grad school was with the International Space University, and that really connected me to all these different streams of activities. Um, everything from my internships with XPRIZE as a starting point but getting involved with analog research, I ended up spending four months in the Arctic on a Mars simulation, um, got to you know, do a whole bunch of cool things as well. And uh, it was just really the connection and the network that really opened things up. Um, I, SCS-132, I was part of the tweet up as well. Um, Janelle, were you part of the tweet up or were you? Yeah, were, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was part of the tweet up. So, yep. See, there you go. See, we're just crossing orbits back and forth. This is how it works. <laughs> this is the space industry. This is, it doesn't matter what country you're from or living in or any of those things. It's like, if you have the passion, you're going to just keep, you know, re-meeting these people or, you know, even collaborating with them along the way. So, um, yeah, they're all right, those things. Right when they call yeah. it like a space family. Yeah. You know, I would have never yeah. thought about it like that. You know, space is such a, I know, I just thought it was such an elite, magical, I don't know, only, <laughs> you know, I used to think like astronauts were superheroes. Yeah, yeah. You know, they were like completely invincible. They were like Father Christmas. You know, you knew that they existed, but you were never going to meet them. <laughs> and then, and then I met them. And then I watched as somebody that I had met was sat on top of a rocket 
that was about, you know, on countless tons of rocket fuel and they were about to light that candle and suddenly I was like, oh, you're not invincible. <laughs> you are a real person and, oh my gosh, you know, it's actually really terrifying. Um, it, it's difficult to believe that these rockets originally were designed for ballistic weapons you know uh, they, they were made for to be nuclear weapons basically and you've got someone who strapped himself to the top of one of these things and is blasting off into the cosmos hmm. it, I, I honestly that really changed because i think I'm, i missed you both because i was on the tweet up for sts 133 um and what an adventure that was um <laughs> but when I first went out there, I'd never seen a rocket launch. You know, I was expecting to see, you know, the, the power and the smoke and the sound and the excitement. But I didn't really think about, oh, and there's like six people on there, like actual mm -hmm. people. Because they, they just, I mean, yeah, like I said, like superheroes, you just don't meet them. But yeah, when you, when you sort of join the space family, when you get to be part of the community, you realize actually it's pretty welcoming. Um, it's pretty small. And it's extremely global. And I think that's one of the things I loved about the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, unfortunately, you're only allowed to be a member until you're 35. And I only discovered it when I was 34. <laughs> um, but it's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, the, the number of people that I met from all around the world who all share this passion. And it's just so nice because, I don't know, you, you can be completely different people, but you all share this passion for space. And so you meet and it's like you're instantly friends for a quite intense burst of a conference or something. And then you've got this like network of people around the world. And actually for me during COVID, it's been really nice. I, I, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm stuck at home, I can't travel. But then I get reports of how other people are dealing with it in their countries. And suddenly I kind of feel like, oh, you know, I'm still connected. We're all still part of this thing. We're in it together. And that, yeah, that's really helped. I, I, I must admit when I, whoa, when I first started, uh, podcasting um i just thought it was going to be myself and my co-host just back and forth about space and then one day i i got an email from nasa goddard flight uh center uh asking whether we would like some personnel to interview and i thought is, is, is this legit you know this this can't be right um so I forwarded it to my co-host and we went through it all and he said, it looks real to me. So I wrote back to them and said, yeah, this would be fantastic. And then after sending the email, I thought to myself, well, hang on a moment. We didn't contact NASA. NASA contacted us. Somebody at NASA has listened to this podcast. Uh, and that blew my mind that is a nice feeling <laughs> <laughs> that, that remind me of um going back to what kate said about chris mckay chris mckay is awesome uh he actually helped us with our, our whole bunch of our mars simulation stuff and so chris is definitely one of those he's one of those heroes like space heroes uh it's not just the astronauts i mean it's a little bit of it's everyone of course but definitely chris <laughs> oh he's yeah he's a dream he can take something incredibly complex and just explain it to you, not make you feel stupid, explain it in an incredibly simple terms. So you're like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. And then you realize like, oh, wait. And if you then look at all the, the literature that he has managed to sort of somehow amalgamate in his head and then put out as just one sentence. And yeah, it's probably like years worth of studying that he's just shared with you in this amazing soundbite and he's great at sound bites too which my background's radio so having somebody that can say something sensible in a short <laughs> space of time and not kind of start a sentence drift off talk about something else come back you know he's perfect for that and and, and so welcoming yeah awesome my life. he'll, he'll be I'll... on the the uk event for 2022 so stay tuned for chris mckay <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I loved it when I was at uh, the first Space Rocks event. And um, when you're doing the interviews and things, they, they, they basically throw, you, throw them in at you straight away. You don't know who you're going to interview. So you're trying to come up with questions from some, for someone that you haven't particularly met before. And 
they always say don't meet your heroes and i got to meet uh matt taylor who's the one of the head engineers and scientists uh for the rosetta program and um meeting him was amazing because he once again he puts things in a very comprehensive way uh it makes it easier for you to understand and not only that at the weekend he's a stormtrooper <laughs> Because well, he's who part is of him, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, so he's part of the 501st, I guess? Yeah, he's part of the Dutch yeah. garrison. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you remember, Kate, he had uh, a, a mock a Stormtrooper helmet that he was getting all the guests to, to sign, and then they were going to auction it off for charity, which was really wow, cool. cool. So you had people like Brian May signing, signing this Stormtrooper helmet which was uh which was amazing and that was the other thing because at space rocks you had the scientists you had people like brian may uh, and the scientists were like oh my gosh it's brian may and brian may's like oh my gosh it's a load of scientists it was like <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh he, he kind of blew us out of the water a little bit because we turned up in this uh kind of limousine out the front of the o2 and we would go out and people going who are they we're just nobody it was the only vehicle we could have got at the time and we felt really good that we just pulled up in this limousine to go into this event and then the word got out that brian may was on his way in a speedboat down the thames <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that kind of blew us out of the water quite literally but uh it was so amazing, you know, uh, and then again, um, because we were in the green room area and having a, a beer with Tim Peak was a surreal mm -hmm. moment. It, it really was. Yeah. And if you ever want to have a, Oh, sorry, Kate, go ahead. I was just gonna say, if you ever want to have a beer with an astronaut, then that's the perf the IAC the, that I mentioned, the conference where we all cross orbits is yep. a good place to have a beer or uh, other every pretty much everything. The uh, 2008 was in Scotland, um, and I don't really remember the plenaries, but I remember four o'clock every day. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, when you say that, I I remember. I think, yeah, actually, maybe it was one of the last. You know, maybe it's the last IAC. And uh, there was some kind of gathering at, at one of the booths. And there was a chap and he was sat down on his own and he had a, a little sweater on, but on his sweater was like a really nice looking mission patch. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, well, that's a good icebreaker, isn't it? I, I like to just talk to people. And it's usually me feeling a little bit like the outsider. I don't quite belong. So I thought if there's somebody on their own, I'll go and talk to them. And I said, oh, I, you know, I like your, your mission patch. And he said, I am cosmonaut. And it turned out he was Helen Sharman's commander. Oh, wow. On the Juno mission. I was like, oh. Um, and we, we sat and we chatted for a while and we, you know, we had a glass of fizz and he wanted some more, but they stopped doing it. So I, I got onto, we, we created a WhatsApp group of the uh, SGAC and the young professionals. And we would share, you know, where are the plug sockets? Where's the Wi-Fi? who's got food on their stand, or I'm giving my presentation to <laughs> But I put a quick message yeah. out who's still serving alcohol? And we went off to find him another glass of wine. <laughs> there you go, using technology to, to help astronauts and cosmonauts. Yeah. yeah, that's the way the way the internet was designed. <laughs> well, so, what I was gonna say was just that, you know, having met Tim Peake or having met astronauts, do you not feel like it's sort of your duty now to, to pass that on because you know, to, to connect. I know that people around where I live, they won't have met an astronaut. Mm. And I'm not saying I'm an astronaut, but I have met an astronaut. So at least I'm like a little connection just to make it feel like, you know, you two could be a part of this. You could be. Mm -hmm. And I think we really, you know, as an industry need to ensure that we get a more diverse range of people and, you know, different backgrounds on it. I mean, not just like in terms of where, where in the world, but also in terms of your financial background as well. I think it's really important just to sort of say, look, you know, come and be part of this. It's relevant to you. There is space for you. Oh gosh, didn't mean to make that pun, but there is space for you, the space for everyone. So we, we just had a question come through. 
And it is, if you could invite anybody from the space industry, whether they be alive or dead, to a dinner party, who would it be and why? Besides Chris McKay? <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, I'll let you guys answer this first. I need to think about this. That's a really hard question. Um, hmm. It's a great question, though. Just we had a, we had a similar like, one like that. About just, party. Yeah. The thing is, from what I've heard about some of the the original astronauts, I mean, if you were to invite them to a dinner party, I think it would get a bit wild. Some of oh, them. Oh, definitely. It would definitely be wild. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've heard lots of stories of from the originals. Because uh, at Space Camp, Ed Buckby used to talk to us about um, all the do- goings on with the, some of the original astronauts because he was one of the um, original kind of like wranglers of them and yeah <laughs> they were a wild bunch they were a wild bunch <laughs> now wondering what's a better title future astronaut from loretta whitesides or astronaut wrangler <laughs> <laughs> right yeah you know yeah. I, I, i'd like to i would really like to meet michael collins because mm. he you know he was like on the far side of the moon on his own Doing something that had never been done before, and I, I, I would just love to have an idea of. I mean, how did that? I've read his book, and it was interesting, and he sort of explains it. But wow, I just really love to talk to him about how isolated and. I mean, that must have been terrifying. Mm. I I saw a tweet that he put up around the uh, the anniversary of the moon landings. And he, somebody asked him the question, uh, out of the three of you, who told the worst jokes? Uh, is it Neil or Buzz? And he said, no, I told the worst jokes. And I thought, is that the reason why they left you behind? <laughs> oh, goodness. I almost feel like he's the, not forgotten, but he's like the lesser known because yeah. the other two walked on the moon. But, but right. he did something that was also kind of incredible. Mm-hmm. He, he was scheduled to be on uh, Apollo 18. Uh, so he never got his chance to actually to go to the moon. So I feel sorry for him in that respect. Mm-hmm. But well, then you've got like Jim you Lovell, st- who went to the moon twice but never walked on never, it. Yeah. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. In the but Apollo that, that, thread, I, I would have loved to have met Al Bean. Um, because my research and current work involved lunar dust and lunar dust mitigation and properties. And I love how he then took that and incorporated that into his kind of his next uh, career of being an artist and put it right Mm. into the paintings. I I just would have, it'd be really, I wouldn't want to have dinner unless it was walking around his gallery or something. So maybe have a beer, a tour or something, that kind of a dinner, liquid dinner with Albine would be really cool. Yeah. Cause that was such amazing, because there's, there's texture to it. Uh, and there, there's also uh, actual real footprints because there's, there's a, like a moon boot actually in the, the, the print of a moon boot actually in the artwork, uh, which makes it completely unique to anything else that was out there. And yeah. And he also ground up, like he had his like original patches and yeah. like cut little tiny bits off and ground them up and sprinkled little bits of those into his paintings. Just yeah. beautiful. Amazing artist. And, and the funny thing is, a lot of uh, astronauts are very gifted when it comes to um, arts and things like that as well. Because uh, have you have you seen the uh, the artwork that uh, uh, Alexei Leonov uh, created? Mm. Because uh, he, the he, Cosmonauts he, exhibition where they had his coloring pencils from space. Yeah, I, I, I just a, it was a little a little box of pencils, and then they had string on them to tie them to the box so that they didn't all float away. And he drew like a, a little sunrise that he'd seen from the capsule. It was, it was beautiful. I I just loved the way that the Russians deal with things in a very simple way, but of a, an effective way. Uh, for for a lot of the space program, they they did things like that and. Uh, I mean, the idea, you know, the um, the little floating toy that you see in the Soyuz to tell you when you're actually in space. I mean, that's such a simple thing and used on every single flight. So, yeah. 
Um, one qu question I wanted to ask was when um, about you guys have all seen rocket launches. What was that like for you the first time you actually saw something launch? I mean, it's it's an amazing feeling. It's quite emotional the first time. I I, I found for me, um, like I said, STS one thirty two. That was the first one I saw um, in person, and I, you know, like Ryan mentioned, we were at the tweet up, and which means we were at the press site, which is three miles from the launch pad, and you can't really get much closer than that. And, and it was an amazing day. Um, we were really lucky, unlike Kate, who had an adventure because um, it <laughs> launched on time. Day. And <laughs> yeah, and it was a great day. Um, and, and so you, you're watching it launch and it's the brightness of it is incredible because I think I wasn't really prepared for how bright it was going to be, like sun's almost brightness. And then you, you know that... The, the sound is going to come later because the, you know, the speed of sound is so much slower than the speed of light. But when you actually experience that, that wave of sound coming towards you across the water and then it, it hits your body and it, you feel the vibrations, that is just incredible. And then just afterwards, after, it, after it's on its way and out of sight, and you just stop and, and, and kind of reflect on everything you've just seen. It's just incredible what what we've done you know as, as as a species we've launched people into space and it's really incredible to think about that um and all of the engineering that goes behind it but it's just really emotional that once it's over mm -hmm. yeah i've got two mini stories um my first i guess you can say set of launches was in 2004 uh was actually seeing spaceship one on its three different flights. So the first one was a test flight in June and then uh, the winning of the Inseri X prize later on September and October. Oh. Um, so that was, it was weird because it's um, growing up, uh, we would always watch like the air show in Toronto. So you're used to like jets, you know, going by super fast. And it, I think the, the more, uh, I guess, you, unreal or like, wow, this is really weird and cool and bizarre was the actual taxiing before the sun rises, watching White Knight lift Spaceship One mm -hmm. um, away from you. And you just kind of see it circling like, oh, there's a plane in the air. And then you see them kind of separate and then you, you don't really hear it or feel it or anything. And you just see like the smoke start and it just starts moving away. And um, it's just, it's very far away. It's very silent, very different that way. Um, and then just as it's as it was coming back down, kind of circling down, kind of gliding down with a couple of chase planes, and then coming to the runway and kind of skidding to a stop, and then they you know hooked it up and brought it right in front of everyone. It was just it was very um, I don't know private is kind of one word for it, but it was like it was very like calm and like and exciting and everything all at the same time. Um, and then my first cool yeah, hmm. and my first like. I guess you can say from the ground launch was um, STS-125. And um, so I was uh. at that time working for BioServe at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I was doing my PhD. And um, I wasn't working the launch, but I went to with the lab to try to help out. Um, they're like, sure, we, we can get you on site. You can help out us prepare for, it was like a microbe experiment for the astronauts to activate in space. And um, so I got to be behind the scenes and see the Space Life Science Building and um, them prep the samples to get to be put onto the space shuttle. Uh, we got to go to the crew walkout and they were filming the IMAX because it was the Hubble, the last Hubble mission, mm -hmm. servicing mission. So it was just like so much going on. And it was just like being on a movie set, it, um, or I guess that's what it would be like on a movie set. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> so it was just like really cool to like be part of this and watch the crew walk out and these, you know, this boom, giant camera swinging by and, um, and then seeing them off in the Astro van to the launch pad. Um, and then I kind of joked that, you know, your first shuttle launch or your first big launch like that, um, it's like your first time and you can read into that as much as you want. You've got your camera, you're fumbling around, you're not sure what's going on. You're like, is this happening? And you try to take a photo and it's all blurry and you're like, okay, well, you know, there's, there's a reason why people say when, you know, if this is the first time you've like really watched the launch that, you know, maybe take a quick photo so you're like because yeah. everyone wants the i was there kind of moment photo and i get that i 
I can't, I can't put my camera down. I have the opposite problem. Um, but you definitely want to just, you know, watch, enjoy, feel it. Um, but yeah, the rumble uh, that hits you with oh, the space shuttle is, is like nothing else. Yeah. It's it really, really cool. is amazing. It yeah. is. I, I can't remember if it was Penn or Teller, but one of them wrote uh, a really nice piece about it's like the ultimate punchline. Because you're just kind of going, you know, you watch it and you're like, whoa, you know, all the smoke comes out and there's the light and then it goes. And so STS-133, uh, it left 115 days late. Um, I packed my bag for 10 days. I stayed for about four and a half months in the US, thankfully on a journalism visa. I didn't break the law. It's all okay. Um, <laughs> so I had like this crazy, amazing adventure. And yeah, so when it finally, finally happened, we tweet up, people were so excited, we're all cheering and whooping, and when that sound died down, there was just this kind of quietness, mm -hmm. and it is that kind of like, oh, sh shouldn't we hear it by now? And then just as you're kind of going, where's the noise? It, it sort of starts kind of rumbling, and, and then it gets louder and louder, and then it, it literally is just like pounding in your chest, and mm -hmm. it makes it kind of weird, not like a it's almost like a popping noise. It's almost like it's like ripping the sky apart. And it is, wow. I mean, that's yeah, a it, I would love to have seen one of these, the Saturn V mm -hmm. go up. Yeah. I mean, wow. That would I have been something. Remember the first time I went to see a shuttle launch and it got scrubbed because uh, Cape Canaveral Sailing Club decided to have some kind of regatta or something. <laughs> and this, this boat decided to go in range and uh yeah it got scrubbed um and it was going to take place again the next day but i wasn't actually in that part of florida uh -huh. the next day um but we did find out which direction to look and we saw this plume this sort of gold white plume go into the sky and then about four minutes later we heard it it was an amazing sound uh, but I did get to go back the next year uh, and I got to see uh, STS-101 uh, launch, which was, which one was that? I can't remember which shuttle that was now. But um, yeah, that was, that was amazing. Uh, I mean, it, it, it just hits you in the chest. It, 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 it does. Uh, but one I of, think one of the tweet up people had um, decided they'd taken the advice. It was their first shuttle launch. So they weren't going to watch it through the camera. Sensible. So they set it up as a little video, got it all right, set it up as a video on a table. And it's brilliant. You, you see this sort of shuttle and it goes through the frame, launches, and then, it, you know, you wait and then the sound comes and you just see the little camera just go <laughs> and, it and it falls off the table. It's like, yes. That is how powerful it is. Yeah. Actually, the, the, the one, the, the shuttle launch that got scrubbed and I uh, got to see it from a distance, uh, uh, we must have been about uh, uh, 50, 60 miles away from, from where it was launched and you know, be able to hear it four, mile, four minutes later from, from there. Uh, we had to get up really, well, we was up about six o'clock in the morning um, and the best place to see it was this grass verge, uh, where there was kind of like a, a bus stop, a trolley bus service went from this grass verge and we were near enough waiting by this bus stop and a group of German tourists came along and they said, are you waiting for a bus? And I said, no, actually we're waiting for a space shuttle. And they started laughing and said, seriously, I'm waiting for a space shuttle. Uh, so just look in that direction. Uh, and sure enough, a few minutes later, we saw it and uh, these guys were like, oh, we're, we're glad we stood with you now because we, we never would have got to see this. You want to so, have some fun in, on a Florida beach, just uh, get a camera and start pointing it like, <laughs> and people come up to you like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, waiting for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's a lot of fun. To, like when you bring in people that are unexpected, uh, not even aware that there's about to be a launch, um, and you you just they experience that with you, and they a lot of times they'll just they, like what's going on, asking questions, and it's, I, I think that's like more fun. I would say in, for a launch experience. So I lived in Cape Canaveral for four years, and in the four years we watched over fifty launches, um, and every single one I'm like I'm getting my camera out. I don't care if it's three in the morning. Um, 
but yeah, we were chasing launches from every angle, uh, and each each one is memorable in a different way. Yeah. yeah, I do. I do the same with the space station when it's flying over. If I know it's going to be a good pass, if I if I'm out, I, I did it once, and I knew there was going to be a good pass over Trafalgar Square. It's a beautiful, clear night. It was going to be a really bright pass, and I I saw it, and then there was a group of tourist school kids mm -hmm. started walking through. And I just thought, I'm just going to go and talk to the teachers, and I I got this whole group of people just <laughs> randomly like looking like whoa, <laughs> but yeah, you know, that. That is crazy to me as well, that I can look up mm -hmm. and I can see, you know, a, a, a space habitat that people have been living on for what, what are we at now? 20, 21 years? There, there are people alive in this 21 world. 21 years, yeah. And they have never experienced a day in their life where there has not been somebody living in space. It is unbelievable. That's incredible. Absolutely. I mean, I can kind of share that with them because... Uh, the year I was born, the actual uh, the, the months before, uh, through the months I was born and after, um, Skylab. And so I, I was born into people living in space, so I can share that same feeling with them. So, yeah, so anybody under the age of 20 doesn't know a time when we haven't been living in space. It's just unreal. I've, I've just had another question come through. It's a, on, a, on a, a slightly more serious note. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it says, uh, with all the tension between the USA and Russia over the years, why and how have they both managed to maintain cooperative and productive relationship with uh, regards to space? Space unites. Mm. It, it is something special about well the international space station mm -hmm. you, you, all, all those all the tension and all the the bad vibes and everything as soon as you get through that hatch you leave it at the hatch that's it's you're completely it's it's not like being part of the earth anymore you are Mm. You, you are a team you've got to get on if you don't get on you're not going to survive i think too a lot of the the tension is between politicians not between astronauts cosmonauts scientists and i think that's part of it as well they're they're outside of the conflict and so they want to work together i've i've seen this before because i was speaking to somebody from russia and they said uh, uh don't hate me and i said well why would i hate you i don't know you and they said well because of the things that the governments are doing i said but that's not you is it you are you i've only just met you and and you know i i've i've got a lot of friends who are russian and the, I think it's the same in any country. You you don't agree with what's going on uh, above you, as it as it were, um, and everyone gets on as much as they can. And when you're in such a close net environment, you you have to get on. You rely on each other. Um, well, because I think it's, it's more than just the astronauts themselves. You know, it goes mm -hmm. it goes slightly deeper than that. Obviously, all the teams supporting them. You know, mm -hmm. it's this big international endeavor. Um, and when you you know, when you go to space conferences, you quite often hear, and I don't know if it is actually a traditional African proverb or not, but they say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think the further we want to explore the universe, the more we're going to have to do together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the, the basis of like international collaboration that we have had is incredibly important. And you've got things like the International Astronautical Federation, and there's also what I think is the coolest club in the world, which is the, uh, oh gosh, what is it? The Association of Space yep. Explorers. Yeah. You know, you can only be a member of this club if you have orbited the Earth at least once. How cool is that? But they, yeah. they have meetings each year and they, you know, they talk as friends because they are, you know, they have more in common than they have as differences. And I think that's the important thing is, you know, Think about why we're the same and not why we're different. Although think... understanding the differences is also important because if you've read um, Ron Garan's book, um, The Orbital Perspective, and there's a wonderful section where they're talking about the early days of the International Space Station development. 
and the meetings where the uh, the Americans would go in um, and they thought that the Russians were very unprofessional because they were getting, you know, they would shout and maybe bang their fist on the table or walk out. And the Russians thought that the Americans just didn't care. You know, because they were just sat there quietly, there was no passion. No passion, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was just that, like, they both had the same goals in the end, but the way that they communicated those goals was slightly different. So, yeah, again, understanding each other is important. I was I was talking to Gareth Jones, who's a, um, a TV presenter. Uh, he used to do a lot of science programs for kids in the 90s. He did uh, How To, which was a, a kid's oh, yeah, science show. And uh, he was saying that the difference between the Americans and the Russians when it comes to space, you just got to look at the way they launch things. Because with, with the, the American launches, it was almost like an episode of Thunderbirds where you had five, four, three, two, one. And the Russians were like, we go to space now. And that's it. <laughs> 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 I think part of the question too, um, the partnership with the space station, which has already been mentioned, it, the common mission and assets as well is a heavy part of that. So the question is what happens after the International Space Station? Um, if we don't have a international program like that, how is that partnership going to unfold and uh, what is that going to do to the, the different space relationships? So. Um, that's something to kind of keep an eye on in the future of exploration is, you know, who are the partners, how are they involved? Um, and just one other kind of side thought about, um, you know, the, the boundaries, political boundaries, there's some very difficult ones. Uh, as an engineer working in the U.S., um, you know, one of the big things is that we can't do, we absolutely can't do anything with China, um, and which makes sense. But uh, when it comes down to it, you know, the U.S. had a recently contact uh, the Chinese Space Agency to get data for Mars. Um, so it's not like there are impossible um, uh, lines in the sand that can't be crossed. Uh, it's just a matter of how we do that. And uh, these agencies around the world are working together. There's no, um, there's no like we can't, we'll never talk to that agency again kind of thing um, going on. It's, it's, there really is a desire to want to unite and be able to share data and work together. What do you think is going to happen with Gateway? I'm just, you know, the, the, the idea that we would have the next international collaboration as Gateway um, stationed by the moon, but Russia's not particularly happy that America wants to have the bigger part in that. And then, you know, what if they don't come on board? What if Russia and China and India decide to do something together and leaves the US behind? Because, I mean, you know, I've, mm -hmm. when Mike Pence was talking at the International Astronautical Congress, it was a I'm not sure he knew his audience because he kept talking about how America was going to be number one and America was yeah. going to be the best at space. And, and like, there's all these people from around the world about to do all these like multinational deals. And he's like, America, this, and oh, those other people, you know, there's going to be part really awkward. I think we need part two of this conversation because that we will go on for a long time, but um, <laughs> that, that, I mean, the, the money side of it is a big part of it. Um, there's a lot of other countries that are now involved that were not previously involved and UAE is a good example. They, they're, you know, they're ready and they want to get involved and they're doing a lot of, uh, missions already in uh, lunar landers to humans in space and everything else. So, um, that's, yeah, I mean, if we're not, if we're not trying to figure this out together, then, you know, it's going to be a lot of chaotic, uh, programs going on at the same time. So, um, programs like Gateway, hopefully, you know, they help bridge those gaps again and uh, find ways to connect the pieces, if you will, like literally connect the modules. Um, I know as a Canadian American that Canada is involved, you know, we've got Canada arm number 17 or whatever. No, <laughs> Canada arm is uh, ready to go. Like that, that's, that's part of it. I mean, that's part of the partnership. Honestly, is Canada has pulled off such a, we pulled off a blinder with Canada arm. I mean, like what a yeah. stroke of marketing genius that was. Yeah, it's so important for Canada that it's on our $5 bill. If you look at the back of the $5 bill yeah. for Canada, you'll see the uh, I, both I the Canadian arm and Dexter. Signed by Chris Hadfield. And oh, there you go. How cool is that? I've been um, carrying around a $5 Canadian bill in my wallet for a decade now. Since it, I think it was about a decade when it came out. Um, it's not the original one that I started with, but I always have one in there just in case. So, I mean, that's yeah. a great, I mean, that's great outreach. You know, that's a yeah. way oh, of yeah. making it literally touchable have it in your pocket <laughs> <laughs> we've got uh 
a few questions come through now. Uh, two of them are kind of related in, in, in many respects. The first one was, uh, how did being the first person in outer space uh, affect Yuri? Um, well, if, if you listen to the official line, it didn't affect him at all. He was invincible. Um, but I think when he came back to Earth, I mean, because he wasn't allowed to go back into space again. Mm -hmm. He was back up, back up crew for Soyuz 1, I think. Uh, but he, was, he wasn't allowed to fly again because they were worried that something might oh, happen to... Yeah, National Treasure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I think that affected him greatly because, you know, he'd spent his entire... Uh, career if you like for that for that moment to happen once and never happen again uh, but have you I read think... um the, uh, is it moon dust and oh, it's about I... the the, uh, the the guy goes to meet all the moonwalkers but the, the first chapter of that book really along these kind of same lines you know all these astronauts went to the moon walked on the moon came back like what do you do then mm. I mean, like, what really is there to strive for? Like, you've literally done, well, not impossible because it's you've done it, but you know, there, what, what higher goal could you possibly have? You've you've mm. been to the moon and back, and I think that did affect quite a lot of them. So right. it would be really interesting to know, especially if he'd lived a little longer, you know, how mm. that would have played out for Yuri. Actually, one of the things he when he came back, uh, they put him back into training program as uh, one of the leads. Uh, trainers for for the other cost, uh, cosmonauts but one of the things he was also doing was trying to design reusable rockets which so, so you know yuri was thinking about that back then so it's quite amazing yeah there, there's your dinner party guest from the earlier question right yeah oh and, yeah there you go yeah. yeah and especially on yuri's night come on <laughs> we <didn't have> yuri. <laughs> um but yeah, he did, he went on tour. I mean, he traveled, to, he came to the UK and, um, you know, was uh, kind of sharing a vision of uniting. And that was very bizarre for someone from the Soviet army to go around saying those things. So, um, and there's a beautiful quote that's somewhere on the Aries Night page about hit what he, his reflections in orbit and looking down and, um, you know, those are, so those are common things that have uh, been said for astronauts for generations about the overview effect. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, uh, it's pretty amazing to think about. And yeah, that, that should be uh, our future, you know, time travel guest, I guess, is to talk to Yuri. Yeah. Cause he came across as so genuine and down to earth. Um, I mean, when he came to the I UK. I describe astronauts as down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he, he went to Manchester and he went to a, a, a metal works, a foundry there, where he started his, his life as a, as a foundry man back in Russia. And they, uh, the unions, uh, the metal the steelworks unions actually gave him a medal, um, of the highest honor that they could give you as, as, a, as a, a, a union member. And he basically said, I am one of you guys. You know, that, that, that's the way he saw himself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so leading on from that, um, does going into space affect your body? Well, we know this <laughs> does. Um, uh, you just asked the, 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 the Kelly twins uh, <laughs> whether it affects your body. Uh mm. I mean, spending a year in, in space, uh, it, it, I think he, uh, Commander Kelly said that it took something like six months for his eyesight to get back back to normal. Um, he, he was seeing sort of like bright flecks every time he, he went outside um, and he wasn't able to walk properly for a, for a long time. Um, but yeah, this is the thing you've got to worry about if we're thinking of going to Mars uh, as a colony, um, it, it, is it physically possible to do? Can can we stay there permanently? Well, as scientists, I think we have to do it and find out. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in the, uh, that's why we're doing all the, you know, the tests and things now. That's why we use the, the space station to start looking at how it affects you and the long duration stuff. I mean, I, I love the, um, the Kelly twins story because as a geneticist, it's like you're doing a twin study and it's the ultimate twin study. One, one astronaut in space, one astronaut, because they were both astronauts, you know, mm -hmm. on the ground. And then yeah. you, you sort of go along and compare them. But it, it does have some pretty big effects on you. You know, you lose um, bone and muscle mass, even if you're doing your uh, exercise every day. Um, you know, your heart shrinks, I think. That was actually, there was just a study that came out this week, wasn't there? They, they did a, they also looked at a swimmer who had, did he swim some crazy distance? But his yeah. heart also uh, got smaller because it wasn't needing to pump against gravity so much, like it wasn't pumping up and down. Mm -hmm. But when you, I think when you get back from space, because you get a lot of, um, you get motion sickness, space sickness when you're in space, because what you're seeing with your eyes doesn't match up with the, the fluid in your ears that is what usually tells you, I'm looking left, right, up, down, because all that, you know, in microgravity, all that fluid is going around and tickling bits of your ear. So your ear is saying, I'm upside down. And your eyes are going, no, I'm not. And then that can make you very, very sick, as uh, mm -hmm. Jake Garn would attest to, I think. Um, but yeah, once you get back down to Earth, your system has to recalibrate again, because you've got used to being all topsy-turvy. You come back down to Earth. So uh, people were told, or I, I heard that... Um, one of the bits of advice for shuttle astronauts was when you when you come down, when you land and you come out of the shuttle, you will be tempted to just look around and have a look at the thing that just brought you back safely from space. But don't do that, because if you look around too quickly, you're just going to throw up. Great, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so we need to factor in vomit time for landing on Mars, um, for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it, the uh, space station usually has, you know, six months rotation. And the reason for that is that that's approximately the duration that it would take to get to Mars and living in microgravity. And until we have something like a short arm centrifuge or other things that can help load your bones and help with the fluid shift, it's, there's a lot that would need to be overcome. Um, but there are astronauts that are coming back with uh, equivalent muscle uh, density and muscle mass because of uh, both drugs, exercise, everything else. Um, but they still have that transition of, you know, not being able to walk function right away. So uh, if we're transiting to Mars, we have to factor that in. You can't just mm -hmm. land the crew and then expect them to walk out the door and look at me, I'm on Mars, let's grab a rock or two and start science. It's not going to happen like that. They, they need a transition recovery period as well. Um, and the there other was, thing is if you want, if you want them to come who back. Suggested yeah. That in order to test for whether astronauts would be able to get out of a capsule on Mars, we should mm -hmm. just let a crew that had been in space on the ISS get out of their spaceship on their own without anybody helping them. Yeah, I that I, I mean, a little bit harsh. Yeah, yeah. that be it would be. I mean, they if you look at the photos of all the astronauts, cosmonauts who come back in Kazakhstan, um, they're basically lifted out and put into a chair and covered with you know lion skins and fur, and they, they they're stuck. They can't move. They can't get out of that chair. They need that help. Um, so the other thing is, if you want to come back from Mars, just say it was just a Mars mission, mm -hmm. then you've also got to condition yourself to go not just from one third gravity, but to microgravity and that back to one G. And yeah. that's going to take more than month to month recovery. That might take years of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I like to say that the, the ultimate uh, simulation would be to, um, you know, go up to the ISS six months, microgravity, then go land in the Arctic for a year. Uh, do your Mars simulation, then go launch back up to space somewhere from the Arctic, of course, we'll have to get another pad, uh, go back to the space station for six months with the windows, you know, you have to slowly board up all the windows so you don't have the view, because there's a whole psychological side of it as well, and then come back yeah. to Earth again. So, you know, have a two-year mission um, with some of those variables to see what happens to the body, and I don't think anyone would ever approve that, um, but you know, being on Earth and that close to friends and family and not being able to actually talk to them either in real time, there's there's a lot of variables, but um, there's a lot of things we can do to at least do pieces of the puzzle to try to figure it out. I wonder, Janelle, like, so you studied psychology. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that I've really wondered about is, you know, never mind the radiation, never mind the space sickness and the bone density and all of this stuff. 
you know, if you are really traveling to Mars, at some point on the journey, you're going to look around and Earth is just going to be a small speck. And I mean, like, how is there any kind of way that we can really properly see how that might affect us? Because I, I think, you know, again, I, I want to talk to Mike Collins about this kind of thing, but, you know, how how weird and disconnected yes. and... I know they do, obviously they do a lot of test psychological testing before choosing the astronauts and mm. before the missions and things like that. But that is definitely, even, you know, we can do the earth analog studies, but you still know you're on earth. And I think that, you know, you've, you, you've got that, if, you know, if I have a major medical emergency, helps just outside the door, which is completely different if you're mm. actually on the way to Mars. And I do think, yeah, I think you're right. What the psychological aspects and how that will affect the astronauts, it would be hard to know ahead of time because we can't really analog it here. Because mm. I, 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 I remember Beth Healy was saying that when they were doing their uh, project, uh, that, I mean, it was 18 months, I think they were pretty much locked up for in, in that environment. And people were going a bit stir crazy. I mean, it was almost like being in lockdown. Uh, you know, people were hiding chocolate bars because they were worried that somebody else was going to steal it from them. They were just hiding things in the rafters and, and things like that because they were so, you know, this is mine, you know, kind of thing. Uh, it was- well, I mean, over, over winter in Antarctica when there's, you know, there's no sunshine either. Mm. I mean, I can't bear, you know, winter in London yeah. when everything goes gray is bad enough, but overwintering yeah. in Antarctica would be- But there's stars and aurora, That's true. so yeah. And little yeah. known fact, the BBC, I don't know if they still do, but the BBC Science Radio Unit used to produce a program that would go out on their winter solstice, so the shortest day in Antarctica, which would be summer for us here. And we would put together a program. Each of the British bases was allowed to choose a song uh, <laughs> or two songs, maybe. So they, and it, they, you could see where like, they'd chosen a song that they liked and then they'd chosen like a really annoying song, like the <laughs> Mana Mana thing, just to annoy their colleagues in the other day. And then we'd get, um, you know, messages from their family and maybe get a, a celebrity or somebody to send them a nice message. And it was just broadcast down to Antarctica. And they apparently on that, on that day they'd have like a sort of mini Christmas sort of thing and they'd swap some presents and they'd listen to this program and that helped them feel a bit more connected. And they, they do celebrate Yuri's night in Antarctica at the, mm -hmm. at the different camps. So um, <laughs> the, the, the thing I, I used to joke about saying, well, at least you're guaranteed to get a cold drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've had so, some really cool celebrations. If you actually, if you want to see um, like a Yuri's Night toast from um, the 10th anniversary from a decade ago, uh, there's a cool video that's on the Yuri's Night YouTube page that you can check out of the of the team down there doing a toast out in the snow. So I think they told mm -hmm. me later that they couldn't actually drink from the toast because it froze in the cup. So they had to like then bring it back inside. And like, yeah, you you, you got to question your your living conditions when your vodka freezes outside. So, um, <clears throat> no, it wasn't that it wasn't that cold. But well, uh, at least if they if they'd have put a, a straw in it, they could have had it as a popsicle, which would have yeah, been yeah yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, what have we got? Uh, next question was: If you could go anywhere in the solar system, where would you choose? The moon. I would go to the moon. I think I I don't think I want to go to Mars. I know that's probably controversial for a lot of space people. Well, I just think not not until they can make the journey quicker. Mm. Yeah. I think because I don't think I would do well with being that far away from Earth and not being able to see it. Whereas I think if you go to the moon, it's a couple of days there, a couple of days back. It's not too bad. You get to bounce around, and you actually on the way would get to these incredible views of the planet in a way that literally, well, a handful, two handfuls of people have actually ever managed to do. I, you know, I think it would be amazing to get to a point where you could see all of the earth, but if you go too much further away and yeah, like it just becomes a speck that, or a pale blue dot, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, th I think I would be too unnerved by that. It, for me, if it was physically possible to go to Titan, 
I'd like to go to Titan so that I could see Saturn close up. Well, yeah, that'd be cool. Very cool. <laughs> I think for me, I assuming it was a shorter journey and we had the technology, Europa would be really cool, especially if we could, you know, do some research while we were there to see what's under the ice. If there really is an ocean, if there's some life there, that would be amazing to to find out. Definitely. I, I'm also an oddball here. I'm also a lunatic. Um, I, you know, growing up even now, like I'm obsessed with looking up at the moon and um, I've said that I'd rather, I, I'd love to spend a year on the moon and um, just to be able to look back at earth as well and see earth. Like I'm looking up at the moon, uh, just seeing it in the sky. Um, and also, I mean, that's what I studied too, you know, studying dust and everything else. And so, and clearly I'm working on a lunar lander. So I, have this link, linkage to wanting to be involved with lunar exploration. But having said all that, um, you know, Mars exploration is definitely the, uh, the goal, the target. Um, but there's, there's things that we can do along the way that include the moon. And so um, that's, the, that's, what I, that's where I, I actually want to go. Um, but all those like, you know, cool planets, Europa, Enceladus, like all the ones that are just, you know, volcano showers of, uh, ice particles and everything like I think those would be unbelievable. Um, yeah, Saturn. The, that going back to astronomy here, uh, you know, Saturn was one of those first things that blew my mind through a telescope. Um, and like, I can see the rings. This is this is, doesn't make any sense. I'm like, this, there's not a photo on the end of the lens here, right? This is real. And like, it really blew me away to like to see something like that. I know when uh, Ross from UK Astronomy, when he ever he's doing. Uh, one of his stargazing events and somebody sets up a telescope towards the moon or somewhere like that and then Ross goes oh I found Saturn and everybody <laughs> goes towards him <laughs> yeah it's that cool if you ever are near a telescope or an event or whatever and and someone says Saturn you drop your other telescope and you run <laughs> <laughs> if you don't actually drop it that would be really bad for the telescope oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah well, if you can actually yeah, carry it, that means it's not a very good scope, right? Because it's not very, it's yeah. not going to be big enough. So, <laughs> yeah, because I mean, some of these setups I've seen in the the UK Astronomy Group, uh, it looked like Ed two hundred nine from you know from, from RoboCop. They're huge things. I mean, thousands and thousands of pounds worth of uh, equipment, but the results you get from them are absolutely spectacular but so that's why i like the moon because it's just there even if you don't have a telescope you can still yeah. you know I, I just love it i just love looking up at it the one thing that um i was i was talking to a friend of mine and he was in italy at the time and it was during a full moon and i was looking at the full moon and he was looking at the full moon and it's like we're in two different countries looking at the same thing at exactly the same time. That is, a, is quite a special feeling knowing you that you start could be singing together as well. Then <laughs> <laughs> there's a movie about this. <laughs> it involves I, a small mouse. <laughs> I, I once, when I was, well, so when I lost my mother, um, I went, I decided I was going to travel the world and I, I left my grandmother uh, a note, a different letter that she could read every week. And the first one, I said, um, these are my stars. And I'd chosen the, and I never know how to pronounce them, if it's the Pleiades, the Pleiades, or... Pleiades, yeah. yeah. Seven Subaru. sisters. You can just say Subaru. And, you Subaru know. is cool, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I, I carefully drew a little map with the stars that she would recognise and sort of, you know, a bit up here and a bit up there and squint, and those are my stars. And I said, I'm going to look at those stars. You can look at those stars and we will still be together. Great, that's a nice thing, I thought. Off I went, and for the first time ever, I crossed the equator. And I got off the plane, <laughs> and I looked up, thinking of my gran, and went, ooh, this doesn't feel right. Oh my gosh, wrong sky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't, I never told her that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I was definitely looking at the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, we've had a question. We've kind of brushed on this already. Uh, if we succeed in colonizing Mars, what do you think of how humans will evolve? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we should. Not colonize. Um, 
we, we've made a mess of one planet already. We shouldn't start making a mess of another one. Um, but what do you think about the fact that humans will evolve whilst they're up there? I mean, I mean people that will be born on Mars, obviously they won't be Earthlings, they'll be Martians. So... <laughs> It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I guess the big question is, have they watched The Expanse yet? Because that's that's one way it might play out. So, um, it, There's always going to be humanity, no matter where we are. Um, so we need to know best of, you know, how do we prepare for that aspect of it and, and maintain that? Um, and I think that's the harder question than the actual physiological parts because we have no idea. We have no idea how uh, bodies will develop in one third gravity. We've got some science that we've done. We've done some microgravity science on small organisms, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, there's it's giant questions, right? So it's almost like you have to jump all the way to the sci-fi, uh, you know, world to look at what are some what are other people's ideas of what that might look like instead of just being, you know, everything is awesome because um, that's what we want, but that's not necessarily reality. Let's just hope it doesn't become Lord of the Flies. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's kind of how the expanse kind of goes, really, with the different uh, planets and areas in space all uh, not battle. Well, I suppose you could say battling against each other politically uh, because the Mars is more of a war in faction than the, the rest of the, the colonies and stuff. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All these politicians uh, just need to calm down and be friendly. <laughs> they just need to become, come and be part of the space family. We'll all be nice to each other. Yeah. yeah. So we, we need to start wrapping things up now. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys quickly, uh, what's coming up next for you? Maybe lunch. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know because Janelle, you've got a, a another uh, I, talk you're doing, haven't I you? I do. Yeah. So as part of our the continuing astronomy in April festival um, on the twenty fourth, so two weeks from today at noon, we're um, we're going to talk about um, DNA and and how things might um, the research we've done on DNA in space. Uh, Kate Rubin's, you know, first. Um, looked at DNA in space, which is really cool. And she's we're going to, to be. yeah, she's, in fact, going back to the dinner conversation, I think I, I would like to have, have her because I met her when she was in Afghan and to, you know, to now be able to talk to her as after yeah. she's been in space would be amazing. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be doing that and, and we'll be extracting DNA from strawberries as well. So it's, it's a, it's a fun one for the, the kids to come along to as well. And then obviously on, on Monday, I'm back to uh, teaching after Easter break. So that's, that's good in this crazy time of no exams and trying to figure out student grades. So that's going to be the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're involved with uh, Uri's Night Kids, aren't you, this year? Yep. Yeah. Um, so on Monday, April... 12th, the actual anniversary, 60th anniversary of First Human Space, Yuri. Um, I've helped set up a Yuri's Night Kids with Janet's Planet. And we have some really cool guests that are going to be on that, including uh, astronaut Nicole Stott and my good friend, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who was just selected to go to space on the Inspiration4 mission. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Eddie Gonzalez from Goddard, um, who is uh, a, not just an advocate, but now a leading role of diversity and inclusion for uh, STEM, for education. Um, so really looking forward to chatting with them. And the cool thing about it, because it's the kids event, you're like, okay, well, we've got all these like, you know, older people talking, is that the, we have a bunch of Janet's uh, students that she's worked with through different types of programs as the moderators. Uh, they're preparing some questions for each panelist. Um, and really the, the goal is to connect, you know, people of all ages and to really be able to uh, connect to those kids, give them an opportunity to obviously meet an astronaut is always cool, right? Um, so it's, 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 that's the goal of it. Um, and I wanted to do that because the uh, tonight, um, which is going to be super late for you guys in the UK, but you should definitely at least try to check out the first bit because 
uh, I think Brian May is actually kicking it off, um, is the main uh, live stream. And so that starts at, uh, I don't even know time zones anymore. So 7 p.m. Uh, New York time, Eastern time. So you can figure out, I think you said it was midnight, midnight in the UK. Something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that's going to be a three-hour program. Um, and that's going to be pretty exciting. There's a lot going on. They just announced like Michael Franti is going to be playing a song on it. But that'll be like three in the morning in the UK. But it is being recorded, so you can catch up on that. So that, anyway, that that event really, you know, it really hits for more of the adults and um, uh, really speaks to kind of like the that sort of audience. So the kids event really kind of hopefully fills in a little bit for some of the youngsters as well. So. And Kate, you've just started a new job, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I'm just doing some freelancing, but um, I've got a couple of irons in the fire and there was just a conference on Friday, uh, Impulse 2021, which brought a whole lot of uh, space communicators and outreach people together. And I've met some new people who are doing really cool stuff. So I'm really excited to have a chat and see what we can do together. Yeah. Actually, whilst, whilst, whilst you're talking there Kate we'll just said someone called Paula Malone who said that she loved uh, your story about your your grandma <laughs> it was weird I'd never crossed the, I'd, I'd never really thought about that I mean the world is small but actually yeah I'd never crossed the equator and it, it was <laughs> it was so strange I, it didn't even really I mean I knew that it would be different but it didn't occur to me and when you look up and it's different stars, like I'm not, you know, I couldn't tell you all of the different constellations. I'm not an astronomer. I know a few of them. But even just glancing, it, it was like, oh, this feels wrong. <laughs> Very surreal. Try it sometime when we're allowed to travel again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Ryan just touched on it uh, just now about the, uh, the global live stream of Yuri's Night. Um, I've got another video from Loretta Whiteside, a little bit about that. Um, so I'm going to play that in and uh, then we're going to sign off. Bear with me a second. Our screens are not frozen. We're still here. <laughs> I also invite those of you who are feeling particularly adventurous and want to stay up really late tonight to join us for the global live stream that will be kicking off in the United States at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, with April 10th, Saturday, April 10th, which is probably about midnight your time, I think. Uh, but we'll have a great pre-party event where you can meet and mingle with an extraordinary ambassadors and space fans from around the world. And then at four o'clock, our live stream kicks off with Richard Branson, Brian May, uh, future astronaut um, in the UK, Trevor Beatty, who's extraordinary, uh, mountain climber from Bangladesh, Waspia Nazarene, and NASA astronauts, Katie Coleman and Leland Melvin. And then we also have second generation astronaut, Richard Garriott and ESA astronaut, Luca Parmitano. So we have an incredible lineup. We have um, OK Go, it will be um, sharing a new music video that we've created with them on the live stream. We'll be giving them our Spirit of Yuri's Night Award. And then the after party, okay, the after party is definitely going to be too late for you. <laughs> but the after party, we have Nervo spinning, uh, DJing in the, in the backstage. If you get the backstage pass, you can come join us for that. If you can't stay up that late, tune in tomorrow on uh, YouTube. You can watch the whole thing. It'll be available on the Yuri's Night channel on YouTube. And we definitely look forward to it having you back and check out our live stream, subscribe to our um, Twitter feed, our Instagram, and make sure to check in with us again next year and keep doing everything you can to use space to bring out the best in you and to bring the world together. Peace, love space, and thank you so much for your support. 60 years ago, Yuri Gagarin brought humanity to space. 40 years ago, the shuttle brought reusability. And 20 years ago, we launched Yuri's Night. Join us for the planet's biggest celebration of space, uniting astronauts, musicians, artists, scientists, and you. Connect, participate, celebrate. The party starts April 10th. For more info, go to yurisnight.net. 
Right, so I'd like to thank you guys for, for joining me this evening or this morning, as the case may be with you, Ryan. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk with people that are so passionate about space and science. And um, obviously there's one thing what we always like to say uh, at Yuri's Night to everybody out there, just rock the planet mm -hmm. and raise a glass if you can at some point uh, for the 12th uh, to a very brave man and as Yuri once said, Poyakali. <laughs> <laughs>